Brilliant. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. And welcome to this masterclass on mergers and acquisitions. My colleague Matt and I are delighted to be running this session for you, and we hope that you'll find this masterclass enjoyable and get involved in the conversation. By the end of this masterclass, we have a couple of aims for you. So we hope that you will, A, know how to break into this practice area, B, know what the work of an m and solicitor involves, and C, know the key issues facing this practice area right now. I'm going to pass over to my colleague Matt and the other panelists in just a moment, but first I'm going to quickly run through some health rules. First and foremost, please use the online question tool to post any questions that you have for our panelists, and Matt will be posing them to our speakers throughout the presentation. And please use the chat tool to let us know if you're having any audio or visual problems. Um, either myself or one of my colleagues will try to sort these for you. Please note that this masterclass is being recorded and the recording of the session will be sent to all registrants after the session and will be available on our YouTube channel very shortly. Please feel free to post about this masterclass on social media using the hashtag LCM Masterclass. And finally, we have so many fantastic masterclass events coming up over the autumn term, so please look out for a link to our next masterclass on how to research law firms in today's follow-up email and check out the Law Careers Nets event page for all the masterclasses we're running this time. Okay, just before I hand over, I'm going to start by asking all attendees to let us know what stage they're at today. So the poll should be popping up on your screen and I'm just gonna give you a minute to answer that. Brilliant, thank you. Keep filling that out. It's going to give you another couple of seconds. Okay, thank you. Fantastic. So, got a lot of second and third year students, non law, postgraduate, and a couple of first year students. So, well done for joining. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I'm going to now pass over to my colleague Matt and to the panelists. Over to you all. Great, thank you, Neve, and um, welcome everybody, and particularly welcome to our panelists. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Um, as Neve says, the idea of this is to try and get under the skin of what M&A work is like, um, and to give you the kind of uh, starting point to uh, consider this as a uh, area of practice that you might like to um, get involved with. So the first thing we're going to do is I'm going to ask each of the panelists to introduce themselves um, very briefly. More importantly, to give us a uh, quick um, pen portrait of their firm as well, because um, we're obviously keen to hear about all the different firms who are represented today. So I'm going to start from my screen from left to right. So Mike, please, could you uh, start? Thank you. Thanks, Matthew. Uh, so I'm Mike Freer. I'm a partner here at Osborne Clark. Um, I am a private equity lawyer by trade. So I'm, I am do a little bit of unusual uh, work in that I act for management teams, largely opposite uh, sponsors, which is a little bit different to a lot of the uh, other private equity lawyers out there in the market. Uh, I've got a particular focus on tech transactions. So I do a lot in the IT uh, communications, cybersecurity world. I'm sure we'll get onto a bit of that later on. Um, in terms of OC as a firm, so we are um, a firm based largely in um, sort of Western Europe. So uh, we are headquarters here in the UK. We've got a lot of uh, lawyers in sort of Western continental Europe as well. We're probably best known uh, as a firm for tech transactions. So working with a lot of entrepreneurs, uh, fast going, growing businesses, businesses at the sort of the cutting edge of the technology that they're, uh, they're working on. Um, we do all kinds of corporate transactions, whether that's uh, M&A, private equity and capital markets, but we cover the, the, the full spectrum. Great, thank you. So uh, next, uh, Craig, please. Hi, thanks, Matt. Hi, everyone. I'm Craig Kelly. I'm counsel at Scadden in the corporate team here. Uh, I'm a Scadden lifer, having having trained here, and um, I specialise in a sort of subset of M&A uh, known as public takeovers. Basically, you get you get two types of M&A. There's the private M&A, uh, which involves private companies, and you get the public side, which involves companies that are listed on a, a stock exchange. Um, linked to that, I actually spent a couple of years at the Takeover Panel, which is the regulator um, for uh, UK public takeovers. And that helps me in my practice because a lot of the clients at Skadden are based overseas and as a result are quite unfamiliar with the, the unique UK takeover regime. And so my experience there helps me sort of explain to them what the, the various hoops are they have to uh, jump through to get to a successful um, transaction. 
A bit about Scandin, we are a, a US law firm. We are based in New York and were founded in 1948. Um, we've since grown to become a global firm and our London office is the second largest uh, in the Scandin network. And historically, we, uh, we were known for um, M&A and in particular, uh, Joe Flom, who was the first ever associate at Scandin, was actually viewed as a pioneer of uh, the hostile takeover way of implementing M&A. Of course, now we're, we're a full service firm now, but M&A remains sort of at the core of uh, our firm and our, our practice. Thanks, Matt. Great, thank you very much. Uh, and um, Dom, next, please. Thank you, Matt. Um, yeah, hi, everyone. My name is uh, Dominic Brown. I'm a two-year PQE um, associate here at Jones Day in the corporate team. Um, and we do do a sort of broad spectrum of, of everything as well. Um, I can be doing a, a sort of standard cross-border M&A transaction um, and then be also working on with private equity clients um, on the sponsor side as well. Um, I trained here at Jones Day having done non-law undergrad then into um, the GDL and LPC so didn't have a law background before starting that. Um, but trained here and the unique, unique thing about Jones Day and our training system is we're non-rotational. Some of you might have seen that on um, you know, the various law careers websites, um, but you can basically come in and take control of your training from day one. So you spend two years going around and knocking on people's doors and looking for work rather than being being boxed in for three or six months in seats. So yeah, I, I did two years of of corporate basically alongside getting the, the requisite training on the other bits that I needed to actually qualify. Um, but that put me in great stead for when I qualified. And um, yeah, Joan State, um, as you may know, is a US founded firm. We've got, I think 44 offices in, in 40 countries now. Um, so pretty global, the work we do is very international. Um, and a lot of our clients sort of, we were founded in late 1800s in the US. So a lot of sort of US industrial classic strategic clients um, that we work for as well as you know, more um, sort of recent private equity clients as well. Great, thank you. And finally, um, Fiona. Thanks. Okay, um, so I am just gone six years qualified now. Um, I work in well i i started off life um as a trainee solicitor in a uk magic circle firm um trained there and stayed for three and a half four years um and was working sort of predominantly on the public mergers and acquisitions side of things um so similar to craig uh, but also with a smattering of private equity and private m a um as well and um then i moved over to while uh, just over two years ago um and have been doing sort of similar stuff um but probably a slightly broader variety of work some kind of equity capital markets um and things like that as well so a lot of stuff that comes out of the of the us as well so a bit of support um for us transactions um in terms of while as a firm, um, again, another US law firm, um, but if anyone's got any questions on um, UK law firms, Mike and, I'm sure myself and Mike will be able to answer those as well. Um, and uh, again, sort of more on the international side of things, we do a lot of work um, here in London, both with um, our US colleagues, but also um, our colleagues in, in Europe as well. We've got offices in, in Germany and France um, that we do a fair amount of work with. Um, and yeah, so the team sort of a, a, a very sort of broad tent of um, P, m and and public m and um, as well. So yeah, we do a bit of everything. Um, but also the, the team in London, the firm in London um, historically has done sort of a lot of restructuring, um, but it's sort of, it's, it's main lines of business, I suppose, in, in the UK are um, private equity and restructuring. Great, well, thank you very much for that, everybody. Um, Fiona, I'm gonna stay with you. Um, I guess let's just um, sort of define our terms to an extent. Could you just give us a quick, a real but basic 101 of what we we actually mean by m a and what what's what's the the width of that and i think we want to encompass you know what what kind of 
transactions are we talking about? What kind of sectors? What kind of parties involved with this? I mean, what you know, and, and from 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 massive to perhaps relatively modest. What's the what's the scope of this? Because obviously it's a huge area. Yeah. So I mean, essentially, when you boil it down to its most um, kind of uh, lowest common denominator elements, you're looking at sort of a com like typically a company buying another company. Um, and whether that will involve, um, you know, whether you want, how you want to structure the deal, whether you're looking at buying a company or buying the assets of the company um, in terms of the different things that you'll need to take into account versus, you know, buying assets or buying shares um, will affect a lot of the transaction documents. Um, and then in terms of the parties, you'll hear people talk about private equity, which is effectively when you're dealing with sponsors um, or who, as their business, will go out and buy companies, try and improve them, work with management teams, um, and then effectively have sort of a horizon within which they want to sell them, usually five to seven years. Um, you will also have public M&A, as, as Craig mentioned, which is the takeover of publicly listed companies, um, which can be by any number of different parties, whether that be an industry or trade buyer um, or a private equity buyer which is what you know you'll hear people talk about a p2p which is a, a take private public to private transaction which is more typically used in in a transaction where a private equity um house is involved as a bidder um so yeah that's a bit, and then you have sort of the sort of straight up and down kind of court, what we call corporate m a which is you know when you're dealing with sort of big corporates rather than private equity transactions you know who perhaps don't um, buy and sell companies as their main business, but you know are buying businesses for you know growth into a different market or a complementary business line, things like that. So in term, uh, in turn, how do, do M and A lawyers specialise, or is it just whatever whatever comes up, or will you be? I mean, I, I'm going to talk to Craig in a bit about public. Um, companies, because that's what he says his his um his specialities. But I mean, you know, the, are you you've described these various types of transaction? Are are you focusing on a specific kind, or do you get a bit of everything? I think when you're more junior, so when you're a trainee or a junior, um, certainly at whichever firm that you're at, um, they should be, and you should be trying to get hold of as much sort of breadth of experience as you possibly can if nothing else to work out what you like more and what you don't like and why um so uh, people will tend to specialize as they get more senior um you know so for example craig's counsel and so he's you know and he's been he did a comment at the panel like all of that will sort of mean that you're doing much more sort of public m a than probably um someone who hasn't um had that kind of specialism over a number of years but um by and large yeah the junior part of your career probably one to three one to four years um post qualification you'll be looking at doing a much broader range of work that being said it will also depend a lot on the firm that you're at and that and the practice of the partners that you're working for so for example mike isn't going to be instructing juniors on doing things like that because the practice is largely based around kind of um management teams as clients and things like that so they'll be doing a lot of um, you know, sell side processes, I imagine, on private equity. I'm sure I'll jump in and correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and things like that. So, if the team that you're in and the team that I was in at my old firm was very much more geared towards public MA, and um, personally, that was one of the reasons that I moved, was I wanted greater variety in the, in the breadth of work that I was doing. Um, but again it entirely depends on on the team that you land in and the partners that you're working for in terms of sort of how available that work is but i'd say generally you know good rule of thumb is try and get as much of, of the experience as you can okay so it's a case of a bit of everything to start with and then hopefully some, something emerges as the right thing so okay well, let's move on to, uh, to to craig and then to mike to, to look at perhaps some people who are doing a bit more of a uh, you know, a particular particular area, Craig. What can you? I mean, first first of all, if you could tell us a bit more about the the, the, the public um, M and A uh, and or what that actually means, and um, and then I think I also want to talk a bit about the takeover panel as well because that sounds quite an interesting angle as well. Sure. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Matt. Yeah, as I as I said at the, uh, the beginning, you've got two types of M um, and A transactions. You've got your private M and A, which 
also involves private equity. There are slight nuances in terms of how you would structure that deal and you know, various complications come with that. But for all intents and purposes, it's a sort of matter of contract law. You'd have an agreement between two parties and you sort of negotiate that agreement. Um, when you're dealing with uh, a public company, um, that's, you know, as I said, a company that's listed on the stock exchange, you've got the added factor that you'll have a whole number of uh, shareholders uh, who will hold those shares and be trading them on a daily basis. And those can range from, you know, your sort of retired uh, person who's, who's doing it as part of the sort of retirement portfolio right through to large institutional sophisticated shareholders. And so there's a different dynamic at play when you do that. And recognising that fact, um, the UK um, impose a, a regulatory regime upon those type of transactions, which you don't get in a private M&A context. And there's a large rule book uh, called the Takeover Code with various rules in it that parties who are involved in public aid transactions have to adhere to. And the sort of the referee on the pitch for any any deal is is the takeover panel. And that's um, where I spent a couple of years on, on Sakomi. Okay, so with the so with the takeover panel, you're you're, you're so you're trying to do it you're trying to do a public MA deal. You're continually referring to the takeover panel for saying, can we do this, can't we do this, or is it more come the end of the deal? There, uh, there, an arbiter says before this deal's allowed to come through, we're we're going to um, run the rule over it, so to speak. Yeah, so it's, it's the former. They, they don't really, um, they're agnostic as to the outcome of the deal, but what they are there to do is to primarily protect shareholders. As I said, they might have shareholders there who are, you know, sort of minorities, uh, shareholders holding very small stakes, but the general principle is that they should be treated equally and fairly, um, regardless of how many shares they own or who they are. Um, they also are there to um, promote um, sort of regulated markets and then ensure that, you know, there's no insider trading, there's no sort of false markets arising because someone becomes aware of an M&A deal uh, before it's been publicly announced. So they get they get involved very so early on. So people are start jumping in and buying shares because they've, they've heard there's some action going on. Precisely. Or if there's been, uh, quite often you'll see a press article will get released that says, oh, we've, we think we've got a scoop here. We hear this company is going to be buying that company. And therefore the panel will say, oh, hold on a second. That looks like a leak has occurred. You need to put an announcement out so everyone's aware that this is something that could happen. And that they're a very user-friendly body. You consult with them throughout the process. They'll give you guidance, um, but they also will be keeping an eye to make sure that all the rules are being adhered to. Because unlike a private context, you can have hostile bids where you've got you know a company that doesn't want to be sold um and you might have a bidder who is actually trying to sell it or trying to buy it and the view at the end of the day is that whether that deal succeeds or fails isn't a matter for the target directors it's for the shareholders if they want to sell the company or not so you can get some quite interesting and exciting dynamics at play okay so so basically what we're saying is the public stuff is 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 New, more nuanced, more more complicated usually. I mean, are, 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 what other particular problems might come up? Um, so I, it's, it's it's just very different from a private MA. I mean, private MA deals can be horrifically complicated and have a whole raft of documents in it. And um, the, the level of documentation of public deal is generally less. Um, the, the bigger issue is it's often played out in public. Um, so, for example, um, back when I was a sort of mid-level associate, one of the deals I was working on was when Pfizer our clients um, were trying to acquire AstraZeneca, which, um, you know, probably two companies that people came been very familiar with over the last couple of years. Um, and AstraZeneca didn't want to be acquired. And they said that the price that Pfizer were offering to pay for them was, you know, undervalued the company. And so we had a sort of, you know, back and forth. There were, you know, public announcement made. Uh, and ultimately the deal, you know, didn't go through because Pfizer were really only willing to, to move forward if they got the, the support of the target company. They wanted to only really go on a friendly basis. Uh, but those are the sort of dynamics that can, you know, be at play. And you're sort of watching it on BBC News in the evening. And, uh, you know, it's, um, you know, family and friends, you know, get a bit more interested in it um, as they sort of follow and uh, see how things are playing out. Okay, so so that's the place to be if you want to be if you want to be uh, the sh the showboating, telling people about what's going on in the world. <laughs> um, so, Mike, if I can turn to you, um, you so you you I mean, we, we've been talking about the sort of the companies buying and selling. You're 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 actually acting in in the main for a, quite a specific niche interest within these transactions. Is that right? Yeah, 
Yeah, that's right. So m most private equity lawyers out there, and indeed most of the private equity lawyers at Osborne Clark will advise what we call the sponsors. That's the private equity houses themselves. So um, they've been mentioned a few times on this um, session already, but a private equity house is effectively a, a private fund that's put together, or it can be a public fund as well, but it's a, it's a fund that's put together to acquire private uh, equity interests. So it's, it's about taking companies private or buying private interests in companies. Uh, so most private equity lawyers out there in the market are advising those funds. They're quite often on panels, they're advising um, those funds regularly on those transactions. Um, typically, a private equity transaction will involve buying a company and backing a management team to run it. So typically, I'm on the other side of those transactions. So I'm advising the management teams or the founders who originally built that company in their dealing with the private equity house. So they're either selling to a private equity house if they founded that business, or they are the team that are running it, they're being backed by a private equity house to, uh, to go off and, uh, and, and run the business and make it much better going forward. Okay, and so what, so, okay, so um, first thing to, 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 to mention, I guess, is especially with founders, you presumably have quite a, a different dynamic of a, a great big private equity house that does this as their day-to-day -day life, whereas the, the founders particularly and the management team are quite often going through this, this whole process for the first time. What, what what are the sort of tensions that derive from that? Yeah, you're absolutely right. So especially with founders, it can be not just the first time they're doing, it, but the only time that they do it. So they may have founded the business, they may have built it from the ground up or from from virtually nothing over a period of you know many years, and it's their baby. And you know you're taking them through the complexities of transaction, but you're also frankly giving them quite a lot of emotional guidance through one of the biggest events in their business career um, and what you would really hope to be able to walk away from that transaction with is you know some very happy clients with frankly a lot of money um, having just realized the fruits of their labors for what might have been their entire career um, with management teams it can be a bit different you're talking to the boards of companies and um, they are um, used to running those businesses they may not be used to running um, processes and being in the in the midst of a private equity transaction depends whether that business has been through transactions before quite often private equity houses like to recruit people who've been through PE deals before and understand the, the private equity world so they may understand the transaction a bit but they're also trying to run um, the business as well as doing the deal so rather than focusing all of their time on doing the deal they're also trying to sort of deal with customers deal with internal staff issues and whatever else may be going on in the business as well Okay, um, uh, and um, as when we when we when we had a little practice chat a couple of days ago, you 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 said that you have been in this business since around the time of the uh, 0708 crash. Um, you know what what does what does the economic cycle do to to M and A um, business volumes and sizes etc. I mean what 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 are the things outside of the um, you know, the immediate industry that they are going to affect whether whether you guys are working because you've or what, or what you're going to be doing. Well, hopefully we're going to keep on working. Um, so <laughs> I, I qualified at um, Eversheds in 2010. So my training contract was through the middle of the um, the 08 09 financial crash. There was a lot of um, liquidity issues in the market. Banks weren't lending. Um, people were sort of quite worried about doing things that were big and transformative with their companies at that particular point in time. Um, since then, we've obviously had a lot of big macro issues. If you look at sort of a UK focus, you've had the Brexit issues that are going on. And then on a more global basis, you've had COVID in, you know, sort of 2020 onwards. Um, and now you've got sort of particular issues going on, especially in the UK in terms of uh, inflation, rising uh, bank rates and so on, which are all sort of causing different economic conditions. And what you tend to find, you tend to get a really good view of this as an M&A lawyer, is that there are sort of peaks and troughs through the economy, um, frankly, if, you know, if you've got a good practice and you've got some good clients out there, there's always things to be doing. But what you do find is there are periods of uh, intense business and there's also periods of uh, sort of quiet times as well, depending on whether it's a good time to be going out and either raising money to do deals, deploying money if you're a private equity fund, um, borrowing money if you're uh, if you're leveraging a transaction through uh, senior debt uh, and those sort of things. Um, I mean, to give you an example, um, probably a more recent example actually if you look at what happened when covid struck so there was a lockdown in the uk from what would be end of march 2020 onwards and actually a huge amount of MA work that was going on at that particular point in time pretty much ground to a halt a lot of people took stock of the market didn't want to deploy funds when 
they didn't know what was going to happen uh, in in the world and with you know the bigger macro picture uh, and then actually what you found was there was a huge amount of m a so since probably the latter half of 2020 onwards most m a lawyers in the city have been you know worked to death because there's just an awful lot going on um there's you know especially in the private equity world there's been a lot of funds sort of seeking opportunities to go and deploy huge amounts of capital that have been been building up and it's been a really really busy time so as a as an m a lawyer and whether that's through private equity probably through public markets as well you're hugely dependent on what's going on in the in the macro world there's always something interesting happening whether that's taking sort of opportunities even if it's not a fantastic macro position um or whether it's you know sort of fighting at the very top of a, of a market and paying premium prices for something because everybody's out there wanting to be doing things right okay so so yeah so it, a downturn always leads to an upturn when everyone plays, plays catch up yeah pretty much and actually you know a lot of clients that we found out there some of the most successful private equity funds have been really active through economic downturns they found really good opportunities to buy things at a lower pricing point uh, or opportunistically from um corporates uh, sellers who want to get rid of a underperforming business for example and then they've taken the, the benefit of that when when times have picked back up again Right, great. Well, thank you. Um, Dom, sorry it lasted you. Sorry to keep you waiting for a while. Um, so, I mean, you know, as, as you said, you're in the, 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 um, the slightly more junior end of the market. So I'm guessing that, um, as, as Fiona was saying, um, you're probably jumping from doing quite a lot of different bits. Um, what, what's the, you know, of the, of the kind of deals you're working on, what's, what's the makeup of them as, as far as sort of, you know, public private, are they PE, are they other formats? What's the, what's, what's the mix that you're seeing at the moment? Um, yeah, a bit of everything, to be honest. Um, I work for, you know, five or six different partners here, um, generally, so get quite a broad mix depending on um, their usual client base. Um, I've done a bit of private m and I've done some public m and deals as well, um, and then also more sort of private equity style um, equity investments and joint ventures, um, things of that nature. So when I think it might not be the same for everyone on this on this panel, but M and A or cor at least here we call it corporate, so we do M and A and PE um, in the same team, and then also that will involve, as as Fiona says, whether it be an asset purchase, um, a share purchase, joint venture agreements for ongoing, um, you know, relationships between between your client and the other side that they're dealing with, um, and then in terms of that also means that we get quite a broad range of of sector and industry that we deal with. So, I mean, one of the things I like about this this little area of work is being able to like get a new deal in, which might be a completely different um, industry, whether it be I've done online gambling and gaming, I've done renewables, energy and infrastructure, um, aerospace and defense, um, then more like classic industrial, so plastics and um, packaging, manufacturing. Um, and then every time you start a new deal, obviously you have, to do due diligence on that company and you swiftly become an expert in in very in very different areas um you've got to do a lot of reading around and you know the clients really value you when you can um you know swat up on these things as quickly as possible and then speak to the real legal issues um underlying what they might be looking at um so i think yeah the, the breadth is is pretty key and i think when you start that is something to be really focused on to try and get as much experience as, as quick as possible. There may be an area that you know was made for you and you know really cool to you, but also you know any experience is good experience, um, and it's only going to add to your sort of your armory later later in your career. Sorry, mute problems there. Um, and and I guess looking forward into your career, you know, how, at what point do you expect that you're going to be going down a more specialist route and and you know a, a, and end up in um, you know a, a, a more focused area, or are you happy for that to to be postponed for quite a while? Yeah, to be honest, I think I'm happy for it to be postponed for a while. Um, I'm, I think being broad is. I mean, there is a there is a people think that being specialist is is the way to go, but I, I also think that there's another side of that coin and, and being able to do um, you know, a wide range of things when, you know, as, as we've discussed, you know, the market goes through peaks and troughs and, um, you know, two, two or three years ago, I was doing mostly public M&A. Um, our clients sort of aren't looking at that area at the moment, so we haven't come across so much and so being more focused on um, private M&A and then within that as well, um, interesting joint ventures that we've been working on. So, 
things come in very much kind of cycles and so um you know there are there are people out there who might specialize in certain areas that end up you know being a bit of a a dead end in terms of what that sort of theme and um what that economic cycle was going through so yeah i think i think keeping as broad as possible is my plan for now right okay and and pre presumably spotting those trends is, is 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 easier said than done so um you know this the the, the eggs in one basket thing def definitely yeah, makes sense you look, at, you look at for example like the listing market in london has pretty much um died you know there there haven't been many um at, at all in the last few years um and so you know when whereas some partners in in my firm at least who are doing a lot of ecm equity capital markets work and listing companies on aim and and um the 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 other sort of public markets they've since gone down so um yeah everything goes in goes in cycles right i guess i guess the other thing to to try and get a, a hook on and you're going you're going to do us a little case study in, in a bit um but but you know what's the what's the actual sort of atmosphere in the sort of the white the white heat of doing this work because clearly you know deals have pressure on them so what what does that mean in the reality of your of your work cycles and you know are you is this a kind of thing where you can knock off in good time or is this thing where you're there all night i mean i don't think anyone will be surprised to hear that it's not um you know your nine to five um but i think in a way um you know there's a lot of hard work and you've got to be diligent and you've got to be prepared to to put in the time but i think also if you're the right sort of person that is quite rewarding when you've been putting in some serious hard graft and you've been having some late nights and um you, know, you get to the end of a deal and you're here with your team and you know the client's super grateful for what you've done for them um you know you've got to have good energy levels um i think good discipline um and kind of thrive off off a bit of stress i think you've, you've got to be careful to manage that and i think one of the one of the characteristics i think which i've come across most of most of my peers and and colleagues here they are very calm um under pressure and so you know flapping hopefully doesn't get doesn't get anyone anywhere and so i think keeping calm keeping measured um just making sure you're you're really on top of every aspect especially as a young as a young lawyer um, whether you're a trainee or you're um you know junior associate um partners who might be focused on other things or um yeah have you know six or seven different deals on their plates whereas you've you've got two or three that are keeping you up then you know being all, all over all over the detail making sure you're as organized as you can be um and that just helps you when you know it's one o'clock in the morning on a on a on a weekend you know that hasn't happened to me many times but um you know you've got to be prepared to put in a bit of sacrifice um but that is also where the most fun can be had, you know, when you're when you're in here um, a late night having some food and you've just got a document out that you need to get out and you sort of have a chat or or you know drink after a deal with your with your colleagues, then that's where the rewarding bit comes from. Great, thank you very much. Um, turning back to you, Fiona. Um, you know, we we said before, um, you know, firms do set up their how they you know how they how they organise their lawyers and they're offering um obviously you've been relatively recently in two different firms I and mean, can you just give us a few um ideas of how you know different firms might, might run things differently in in what's ostensibly the same sort of area um i think in terms of how the the different offerings of firms works i mean i can really only speak to my experience obviously but um I was a very large magic circle fan. I was a, a clip of chance down in Canary Wharf. And, you know, one of their big selling points to clients is they've got um, sort of an expert for everyone, for everything in the building. Um, and so that can lead to things being quite sort of siloed and, you know, everyone doing their very specific bit. Um, and because, you know, they've sort of got the people to be able to cater for every different specialism i think in a us firm particularly a smaller firm um or somewhere that's got a smaller office in, in london you can often sort of need to turn your hand um to a sort of greater variety of, of work um i think is one of the biggest differences that i noticed in sort of you know you've got to sort of have that um extra willingness just to kind of not have your blinders on and 
you know, say I'm a financing lawyer, so I'm only going to do financing documents and that's it. Um, you know, there's a bit more creativity and a bit more sort of um, willingness to get involved in, in all different types of things. Um, I would say is a key difference. Um, I think that, you know, the teams generally, and again, Dom and Craig can speak to this just to, if it's true at sort of Scadden and Jones Day as well, but I think the teams at US firms tend to be a little bit leaner. Um, and so, you know, there's the potential to get a bit more responsibility potentially when you're a bit more junior as well as a lawyer. Um, but yeah, I think generally those are sort of the day-to-day -day differences that I'd, I'd know. I think the work, obviously a lot of the US firms have come into London and sort of established themselves very strongly in the private equity um, market. And that's sort of been the bit that they've done initially and then built out on that um, into doing other bits and pieces of M&A. Um, but that's not to say that, you know, there are obviously um, other UK firms that have been doing private equity as well um, for a very long time and also very, very good at it. So I don't think there's necessarily sort of a firm to go to over another, you know, on that basis, as it were, between US and UK. OK, but there's but there's certainly cultural and organisational differences to identify and, and to see, you know, that sounds like it might be the thing for me. Yeah. Um, OK. Turning to, to Mike, um, well, I think one thing we you know we we obviously need to to understand is the position of the 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 sort of the M and A practice within the context of the greater firm. I mean, how much is the I mean, how much the M and A people working with with other parts of the firm? Um, are you assisting them? Are they assisting you? How does that how does that whole process work as a as an organic whole for a law firm? Yeah, I think um, it's probably builds nicely on what Fiona was just saying, actually, in terms of, you know, different firms will have slightly different approaches to, to how they do this. Probably for the, I mean, I've, I've only worked for UK firms, but the UK firms that I've I've worked at, M&A has been a huge part of that firm. It's been uh, sort of described as the engine room of the firm, really. And it's, you know, it's, it's a huge part of the, of the income model for the firm. Um, but also it throws off a lot of work for other specialist teams. And just as a sort of a hint and a tip for a junior lawyer, I'd always say, um, go and make friends with your uh, your peers in specialist teams. Um, I think it's really, really important that you have a great working relationship with them. Um, corporate transactions of any kind are big team efforts, and you know whether that's a, a team within the, the corporate groups you're working with, those immediately around you, and, and the partners you're working with, and, and other junior lawyers. Um, but the, it also regularly involves your specialist teams, um, and so we were encouraged as as juniors when I was at Eversheds to to actually go and get to know our specialists. They shouldn't just be somebody at the end of the phone or 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 on an email. They should be somebody who you actually know. And you know, frankly, if you need to call in a favour from them at some ungodly hour because something's come up and it's a really specialist issue but it's really important to the transaction you're working on um you know you need to be able to do that and for them to to pull out all the stops to get that to you so you know corporate transactions are a big sort of work generator for for most big city firms really um they what you tend to find as well is that um a lot of uh, people who sort of run corporate relationships, whether that's partners or senior lawyers, um, are then you know quite often involved in um, introducing those relationships uh, relationships to other parts of the firm as well. So even if it's not sort of as part of a transactional process, they can often be the the person managing the client account and uh, introducing them to specialist teams for for different types of projects as well. So it, it's quite central to what we do. Okay, and which, and which are the which which would you say the the other departments that you have the most dealings with would be? Uh, I mean, tax is on everything. Uh, tax is very specialist, and um, you know whether that's uh, your internal tax lawyers. If you don't have a tax department on the firm you're working at, then there's definitely a need for tax on transactions. Uh, financing has been mentioned. Different firms do that in different ways. So uh, some firms will effectively carry out the financing transactions through, through through the same lawyers. Some will have specialist finance teams to do that. Um, and then really it's, it's a it's a huge range of other uh, specialists i mean doing what i do advising management teams employment and incentives are very important to me um so they they will be involved in um in looking at service agreements for the managers that we're working with and the, the ceos that we're working with that's something that's very personal to them but i think it depends on on what you do if you're a uh, specialist in financial services for example then your um financial institutions group might be really important and you know regulatory lawyers who are looking at at, at that sort of side of things so 
uh, it can be you know a very wide variety of people and um, i should probably add real estate in there as well especially if, you, if you're doing a lot in say retail and consumer and you've got a big high street presence you might have an awful lot to do in terms of looking at a big property portfolio right okay thank you um craig um one thing that i guess is is, is always absolutely crucial is sort of where, where does the work come from how do, you, how do you develop business how do the relationships work um Clearly, I guess there's a difference between people that you see once for a one-off transaction against people that you see for over and over again, I guess, PE houses in particular. That, that's exactly right. So if you've got a, a client that's a financial sponsor, a PE house that's um, you know doing multiple M&A transactions uh, throughout the course of the year, then you, you that's a particular way to manage that relationship and, and keep them happy. Um, when you've got sort of, you know, strategic buyers, you know, who are maybe doing a large transformative M&A deal that they would only do every five to ten years, then that sort of it, it, it's different. I think it's important to, um, from a firm perspective, make sure that you're on everyone's radar. And when you know, they're considering which legal counsel that they want to engage, that um, you're well known in the market, uh, you're regarded as you know experts in that particular type of transaction. Um, a lot of the work we get at um, Scadden will come from um, our US colleagues, so they'll have strong relationships with um, some of the big US corporates there. And you know, any time that they're considering um, a transaction involving a UK company, they would sort of refer the work over to us. And then, um, you know, from, from a public M&A perspective, I try and maintain good relationships with other advisors on M&A deals, in particular um, investment banks. Um, quite often they might get involved in the transaction earlier than the lawyers uh, do, um, primarily because they don't start charging and they don't charge by the hour and they can get a lot of free work from them. Um, but they might quite often get asked the question by the client when it comes to the stage of engaging legal counsel, you know, who, who would you recommend, who do you think is, um, is, is best placed for that? And so it's important that you've got that reputation amongst um, the other advisory community as well. And do you and, and do you have to spend much time sort of taking your clients out and, and and schmoozing them, or is it pretty much the works always coming in there? That that always helps. Clients li like to be uh, kept happy, and um, I think it's uh, you know probably the the more fun part of the job is um, getting to know them on that sort of social level as well. Because clients, you know, at the end of the day, they're all humans, and being able to forge personal connections with them is is particularly important. Um, you know, as Dom said, you, quite often you'll be working late into the night with them. And, um, you know, if you've got a sort of bond with them that, you know, can take you through the transaction and, you know, you can celebrate at the end of it, it's, um, it's a great, great feeling. Great. Well, one, th one other thing I noticed, which I'm sure is all part of the mix as well, is um, sort of producing, producing materials. I mean, if I was looking at your, your page on the firm's website and there's links to um, various fairly uh, extensive documents. Um, I think there's a one bit of big takeovers document and some, um, and some reports on, you know, what's the state of the market like? Are those, are those things that to, to actually generate business or are they things that need to be seen to be done to, to maintain your position as, as experts? I think it's a bit of both. I think it's, um, you know, we, we as a firm have a sort of takeovers guide, which um, is a sort of, you know, a simplified version of how to do a public M&A deal. We all send that to clients and other advisors, and I say, we keep that updated, and it's a good sort of um, talking point with them. You know, we'll update it every couple of years, and it's an opportunity for us to sort of get back in touch with clients or potential clients that you haven't um, you know spoken to recently similarly in terms of our more periodic updates you know we'll, we'll do every sort of six months and the end of the year just an update on what the MA landscape is looking like what our predictions are for the future and again it's just something that clients find quite useful uh, and also other lawyers um, in the firm you know if they are they may not be an MA lawyer they might you know be you know, financial services group or whatever and it just gives them something that you know if they get asked questions um, by clients on a topic that they're not particularly familiar with that they can sort of uh, you know be able to speak about it great okay now i'm going to turn to dom dom if we could um so, so as we as we discussed before if you could perhaps give us a a hypothetical example of a hypothetical deal of just a, perhaps step by step of um what happens who speaks to who and, and what the lawyers do and what happens at the end yeah, no problem at all. I mean, I did have a, a sort of more, more live example, um, okay, which perfect. might also be useful. But uh, I mean, I can also go through how it would typically work. I mean, the way it would happen is, I suppose, it all it normally starts off by 
your client speaking to the other side directly. So whether it be the company that they want to acquire or the company to which they want to sell their business, that normally starts off with discussions amongst themselves and then they work through you know high level terms the general structure of the deal um and sort of get a base commercial agreement um as to what it might look like and then that's the point at which they start to involve um law firms and uh, other advisors whether it be tax advisors financial advisors accountants um all the rest and they basically start coming to to lawyers to to thrash out detail and so you get involved on that high level term sheet um which kind of sets the framework for the deal. Um, and then if they're sort of happy with that and they, they agreed in principle on the way, you know, whether it be headline price or, you know, the structure for Mike's, in Mike's case, you know, are our management going to get, um, you know, new equity in the business? Are they going to be paid, you know, the bonuses that they're allowed under incentive plan? Um, and then once everyone's happy with that, then you start work on the deal property, you get into the real guts of it. Um, the first way in which that starts really is due diligence. Um, so whether it's uh, if you're acting on the buy side, if you're buying a company, um, you might get access to a data room. They used to be literally rooms of files of um, documents and contracts and everything you go into, um, hence, hence the reference to a room. Um, but now they're all online. You put a load of documents online, essentially like a huge Dropbox. There are various providers that find that, um, that, that provide that service. Um, and then you're let loose in there. Um, so you might ask a set of questions that you need to answer that go to all the legal issues that, that you wanna be looking at, whether that be you know, legal title to shares, whether it be the contracts that are, that are in place at the moment with suppliers and customers, um, you look at their employment numbers, um, whether, whether all employment contracts are in, in the right form, if they have any onerous clauses in them, that goes across all the contractual framework um, with the business. Um, you're also looking at their real estate, if it's a real estate business or if it has, um, you know, whether if, if it's an industrial manufacturer, they've got sites around Europe or the UK. Um, so then you really get into the guts of that in, and, the, and the due diligence process. That's very much something that you would do as a junior um, so you really get involved firstly as a corporate, as an M&A um, lawyer, you look at the corporate side of things. So that can be anything from commercial contracts to, you know, the articles of association of a company, the statutory books that are in place. Um, and then you're really the kind of quarterback for the rest of the, the kind of specialist areas. So as Mike says, you're, you're keeping on the good side of all the people that need to help you in employment and pensions and um, tax and insurance and every other kind of specialist knowledge area that you need you need them on site to feed into you and you're often you are in charge of piecing that all together you know knitting together different people's styles of of writing making sure it's all along the same theme um and really sort of telling a continuous story highlighting the key legal issues to your client and then once that sort of you know flushed out often you'll see if that flushes out big major issues big red flags then the client might you know, go back to commercial discussions and say, you know, we found this issue, which means we want to we want to take you know, X amount off the price or um, you know, we need to know more about this. And so you, re you can really dig into like a lot of back and forth over the question and answers on that. You might have expert sessions with members of their legal team or members of their management. Um, so that's kind of the diligence process as it progresses towards the moment when you're ready to sign definitive documents. And then sort of alongside that, you might have um, you know, the actual drafting of the deal documents themselves. Um, so you, you get into whether it's a share purchase deal, let's just do it for simplicity. Um, you're, you could be in charge of drafting the SPA, um, which is the sale and purchase agreement um, in respect to the transaction. Whether that's drafted by the buy side or the sell side, um, it depends. Often, you know, they they can ask buy side to draft it up and then you might serve up quite a favorable draft to your client, um, depending on your instructions. Um, or if it's an auction deal and you're part of a, you know, an auction process, maybe 10 or, 10 or 11 bidders bidding for this sort of premium business, um, then there might already be a draft SPA in the data room, which you'll then encourage to mark up as best you can to find a good middle ground so that when you submit your 
your bid on the bid date, then you're you're taken through to exclusivity, and and they like the way you've marked it up. It's not too onerous. It's not asking too much for them. Um, so it could be that drafted that way as well. Um, then alongside that, obviously you've got the main documents, but there are often thousands of others that need to be drafted. Not quite in the thousands, but certainly tens. Um, of all the ancillaries that are involved in a transaction. And those are key, especially as a junior lawyer, um, when you start your career, whether that be director resignation letters, um, you know, re releases of, of banking, finance, security, you're working with the finance, the finance teams um, to make sure that's done properly. Um, you might have various different side letters or letters to management, um, you know, bonus letters to management, things like that. So. It's it's quite document heavy, I would say, um, but that's kind of an opportunity as a young lawyer to get good drafting experience on some of these sort of not less important, equally important, but also sort of more mechanical things that you can get real drafting experience on and cut your teeth on. Um, particularly at Jones Day, uh, as Fiona said, you know, we we American firms do tend to run a bit leaner, um, and the great thing about here is, you know, I was already asked to draft an SPA in my second year of it as being a trainee and you get that responsibility very quickly which is scary but and stressful um, but also the way you, know, you, you you learn the quickest um, and you know the first markup I did was an absolute bloodbath and it came back from the partner and you know we talked through it but then that's the way you improve um, so yeah I think you know to give you to give you an example of how that might work in practice slightly different scenario but we, we I recently earlier this year I did um essentially an MA deal but it involved also a joint venture aspect which was quite interesting um so we were acting for geely which is a big chinese car company um you know they own all the electric cab back cabs in london um load the huge you know growing car company from coming out of china they're our client and we were acting for them um opposite renault uh, which i'm sure all of you have heard of the french car company both um essentially combining their internal combustion engine, gearbox, drivetrain businesses, both multi-billion pound businesses stretched over all different regions of the world, um, you know, whether it be manufacturing plants in Chile or Portugal to um, Geely's own plants back in China. Um, so super complicated carve out from their existing structures um, and then kind of putting them together into a joint venture for the next 25 years. Um, so what's quite interesting, maybe, talk about that hopefully if all things go well you do an acquisition a straightforward SPA where somebody buys and somebody sells and you know after a couple of months once you've um, might have adjusted the the purchase price after after the deal is closed you hopefully never have to look at that document again um, unless there's been a breach or a warranty a warranty claim or something of that sort um, whereas for joint ventures obviously it's a live document it has it has um, a time period during which uh, you know, very, either party has governance rights to the business as it, as it goes forward. It has economic rights to dividends um, through, you know, distributions. So that's really a kind of quite interesting way to think about it. You've got to be not that you're, you know, sort of you're thinking about it in a different way because it's a live document. Um, so what we were trying to achieve for Geely, obviously, is protection on its economic position and on its governance position. Um, you don't want to be in in a joint venture whereby you're excluded from voting on se serious matters um you know whether that be potentially buying a new business or issuing new shares taking on new debt you want to have protections um in your position as shareholder um and then also you know building into that deal in particular a complicated regulatory framework so um you know you had import and export um activities over a, a vast range of different countries um, with different legal regimes and you know with the added kind of input of how how you're going to protect for example company data personal mm -hmm. data um, both com both companies were very much looking at their um, ESG and sustainability goals so setting targets for those within the joint venture and its business um, and then also sort of building in Obviously, we've got the Ukrainian war going on at the moment, so there's there's ever more increased focus on sanctions. So we were in constant okay. contact with our <clears throat> regulatory colleagues to make sure that everything we were doing was in line with um, with how the sanctions regimes were constantly evolving. Um, so so I think 
what I'm trying to emphasize here is that you're not just a corporate lawyer dealing with you know buying and selling shares you've you've got to be kind of very broad spectrum and aware of all the different issues um, and think and think and think laterally about what the what what things might come from from uh, from from whatever side exactly. okay well thank you so we, i think we've got to move on there because we're we're, we're running a bit low on time um I th one one thing I've, uh, if has anyone got any more questions any questions we've not had very many questions oh chat sorry sorry i'm looking in the wrong place everybody let's have a few questions then um sorry random screens are appearing on my screen right okay so what um what makes uh, each firm's m a department stand out from the others so um who'd like to take that craig <laughs> I'm sure all of our respective M&A teams are, uh, you know, as, as good as each other. I think in terms of standing out, it's obviously different client bases, different transactions you've worked on, um, and you always want to keep 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 bettering yourselves. But, you know, I think in terms of the firms represented today, um, if you're a client, you'd be uh, in good hands with, with any of us, really. Great, great. Um, Fiona, this is one specific for you. Can you talk a bit more about differentiating between uh, the subsections of M&A and which parts are the most and least enjoyable? Sounds a pretty subjective question to me. Uh, I mean, you know, some of them are always feel a bit more glamorous than others. Um, I, I worked on the takeover of Arsenal Football Club in 2018, I believe it was, um, which was possibly one of the cooler of the deals that I've done. Um, but uh, I think the the public m and a staff has the um has the benefit of tending to get a bit more on the front page and sort of as as Craig said, it's sort of quite interesting to be able to discuss that with people when it all gets announced and and sort of feel like you really know what's kind of going on at the at the forefront of markets and things like that. Um, but then there's more cre creativity involved in a private M&A transaction or a private equity transaction because there's much more you can do um, without all of the heavy regulation from the takeover code and things like that. And so you've got much more freedom to, to get a bit more creative with your solutions and the way that you structure things. Um, so, I, you know, there's, there's, there's definitely benefits to both. Right. OK. Um, Mike, let's ask you. Um... Uh, how much for for people who are you know coming in for vacation scheme or training contract interviews, what sort of level of understanding of M and A do you think they should have? Well, we're not expecting you to have done any M and A. Put it that way. It's not the sort of thing you do in your spare time at home. Um, I think it's probably a really good idea to do a little bit of background reading to the extent you can. Um, at that sort of level, we're not going to expect you to have had loads of experience of the company's act and, and, and know that inside out. But just do a bit of digging in terms of you know what it actually means to be involved in, a, in an M&A process. Understand a little bit about how the investment banking world works would be a good idea. Just some desktop research, really. Um, as I say, we're not going to expect you to have been in that world before. Great. There's, there's, a, there's one here specifically for Dom. And after talking that great, great listening of things you've got to cover, how, how, do, you, how do you stay organised? um yeah it's not i don't everyone has their different different ways um of doing it i mean ov obviously the go-to is just a straight up to-do list and whether that's old-fashioned on your on your notepad um and putting things down in in priority order but often you know there'll be something that comes in during the day that really jumps to the top and pushes everything else down um you know i've seen some people do that on on their computer and just you know, having a sensible filing system on your emails, all that mundane stuff um, yeah. that really kind of contributes towards having a sort of calmer work work environment and making sure that you're not, you know, letting your, your emails get out of control. I mean, I can't speak for everyone on this, but um, it certainly kind of stresses me out when I get to more more than, you know, 30 or 40 unread emails in a day. Um, and so keeping that kind of stuff, keeping on top of that um, will go a long way to making sure you're kind of, kind of clear yeah ahead clear mind okay thank you now uh, we've got very short period of time so can we just have a quick top tip for getting to the top in MA? let's start with you fiona or even getting to the bottom even getting to the starting line i think resilience is a big one um sort of staying curious um and and being enthusiastic gets you a really long way and just focusing on um focusing on the fundamentals Great. Craig? 
Uh, I say read the financial press. You know, a lot of this is all about commercial awareness and understand why your client has wanted to do the transaction, what factors you know might be relevant for them. So this really is the one where where, where it's 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 read the Financial Times. <laughs> Great, and Mike. Yeah, I was going to say something similar, actually, um, but actually just get to really understand your client. I think you've got a great opportunity in the M&A world to spend a lot of time with your client and really understand their commercial drivers. But yeah, get behind that, speak to them as much as you possibly can and really understand what's uh, driving the transaction you're working on. Right. And finally, Dom, what do you think would be the secret to success? Um, I think more, more on a kind of personal development level, I think always come in to work with a positive attitude and a proactive attitude um because that's only you want people to value you within the team and i think that goes a long way both with clients and internally um so always make sure you're bringing your best self um to the office and to the team that you're working with um and that positive you know good humor and you know proactive attitude goes a long way great well look that's that we're out of time thank you so much to all the panelists um we've got through a lot of um content there i think um Neve's just put a um survey up on the um on the screen so please answer answer that and um as i say thanks again i'm going to pass over back to Neve for some final bits of housekeeping and, and just thanks again to all the panel thank you matt yes thank you so much to everyone for getting involved with today and thank you for joining this session i just want to run this poll quickly going to give you another few seconds because we'd love to hear what you take from today uh, before you go just another reminder to attendees that we will be sending out a link containing the recorded session i saw a couple of you asked that in the chat so please keep an eye out for that and also as you leave there'll be a survey popping up once the masterclass has ended so please fill that in let us know how you enjoyed today what you enjoyed in particular and what you would like to see us cover in the future thank you very much again to all our panelists who joined us today and also we have got so many amazing masterclasses coming up so we've got researching firms we've got intellectual property we've got law firm applications every single one of those can be found on our events page so please please do come and get involved in those it's brilliant to hear that you all have learned how to what the work of a solicitor in this area involves, knowing the key issues, know how to break into this practice area. So I would like to thank you all for joining us today and hope to see you all again soon. Thank you very much.